to see so many students and faculty members here. Every year since the tragic events of September 11, 2001, Liberty High School has taken time to remember that day and the innocent lives lost in the attacks that happened 20 years ago tomorrow. It seems every generation experiences at least one event so impactful that it's seared into their memories. The generations of the 1940s remember Pearl Harbor. The generations of the 1960s remember the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And the generations of the century's turn will always remember September 11th. Those of us who experience that day have a choice about what, <clears throat> do not have a choice about whether or not we remember. The memories will always be there for the rest of our lives. The choice we do have is whether or not we acknowledge those memories, whether or not we memorialize them. For each generation that comes after, those who have no memory of that day, your generation, the choice is much more difficult and in many ways more important. Your generation's choice, whether or not to commemorate September 11, 2001, for years to come, decides whether or not the, gen the memories of my generation endure or simply fade away. Our speaker today is Joseph Stellato. Mr. Stellato is head of the Health and Phys Ed Department at Freedom High School and a proud graduate of Liberty High School, class of 1989. After the attacks of September 11, 2001, Mr. Stellato assisted with the recovery efforts at Ground Zero in New York City. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joseph Stellato. Thank you, and thank you for having me today. And when he talks about the generations and who remembers, and, and our generation, anyone old, uh, younger, than, older than you guys would obviously remember where exactly they were when they heard about the plane hitting the tower. And I was at Miller Heights Elementary School and I was in the faculty lounge and watching the news after we heard, we put the news on and we were watching what was occurring. And at that time, it's human nature to go through a list of your friends and family that might have been there or injured or hurt in any way. So right away, instantly, I start making a list of people that I knew because New York City is not very far from here. And as that list went on and we went home that day, we got out of school and I started making phone calls to make sure family and friends that I might have known in New York were okay. And I found out that everybody was. And then my heart went to those who did lose their lives the firemen, the policemen, the people that were in the building. And I went to bed with a heavy heart that evening. And I was woken up at 3 a.m. for a phone call. And my friend, my roommate, called me and he was screaming on the phone and crying and I couldn't even make out who he was. And I finally realized it was Todd, who was a roommate in college of mine and a best friend of mine, and I finally calmed him down, and he kept saying, Marty is gone, Marty is gone. And I still didn't understand what he was talking about. I go, Todd, relax, what are, we, what are you talking about, he's gone? And then he said, Marty was in the tower. And Marty was a roommate of ours also, and a best friend of mine. And from that moment on, my life changed when he told me that. So I said, all right, Todd, I'm gonna, come up and pick you up in the morning and we're going to go to Marty's house where his wife is, where we knew the family very well. So I picked up Todd in the morning uh, and we drove out to New, uh, New Jersey where his wife and family are. And we went into this house where his mom, dad, brother, sister, uh, his wife, he didn't have any good uh, kids at the time. We went in and obviously there was a lot of emotions going on. But there was also a lot of positivity, like talking about that Marty might still be living. And, and we really believe that if anybody could have got out of that tower, it would have been Marty. And we told Marty stories. We played football with Marty, so we knew how tough of a kid he was. 
and, and we told Marty stories and we know he could have, could have got down. He would have been the one helping people to get down. That's the kind of guy he was. And we said to the family, we kept positive feelings there and we started pulling out maps and making signs and, and we all kind of took our role and kind of went to different hospitals and start looking up John Doe's and we were looking for Marty and the whole entire day we were out looking for him we came back around dinner time and, and kind of reflected on what just occurred and, and going through everything that we did and and we were still trying to stay positive, saying if anybody can do it, Marty can do it. Maybe he hit his head and he didn't have a phone and maybe he, didn't, he couldn't get a hold of us or whatever. And we ate dinner and we, we sat around and told stories. And, and then all, the whole day, the brother was just not that positive. And we tried to continually pick him up. And me and my two other roommates, we went outside with him and we said, what's up? You know, he's going to be okay. We're going to find Marty. And he said, no, we're not. And we said, how do you know? Is it, is it just the brotherly thing that you have going here? Or what, how do you know we're not going to find Marty? He's going to be OK. And he said, Marty called him. So when Marty was on the 104th floor, the first plane hit, he called his brother, which was two buildings down, looking out the window. And he told his brother, what is going on? And his brother told him, that a plane hit, accidentally hit the building. So Marty said, okay, I'm gonna tell everybody I'm okay, call my wife, Karen, call, my, call mom and dad, tell them I'm okay. And I'm gonna work my way down. And at that point, Marty did that. And about 20 minutes later, he called again. And now, he was screaming on the phone. He, there was mad chaos behind him and the brother was trying to calm him down and give him suggestions on what to do, telling him to climb to the window and try to breathe because there was so much smoke coming up. He was above where the plane hit. And Marty was just so panicking and screaming and he said people are stepping on him. He was on the floor crawling and people are stepping over him. People are stepping over him to jump out of the building. Think about jumping from 104 floors, what that must have been like and what that decision must have been like to make that decision to jump. And Marty's brother's telling him not to and just stay there, hang in there. We're gonna, they're sending help. We're going to get there for you. And all of a sudden, a sense of calm came over Marty, and he said, tell mom and dad I love them. Tell my friends I love them. And tell everybody I said goodbye. And he said, no, Marty, no. He didn't hear from Marty again. The phone didn't die. The phone was sitting there and, and the brother still screaming Marty. And he could just hear the chaos that was going on. So the brother told us this story and, and he didn't tell the parents or the family members that he called back. He just told them the first time he called him, Marty's going to be okay and he's working his way down. So we had the job of going in with his brother and telling the family what occurred. So that was the most difficult discussion I've ever had to have with anybody in my life because the brother couldn't explain it. So we had to tell the family what has occurred. The rest of that evening was obviously emotional, very difficult. It was the day after 9-11. We went to bed, uh, barely sleeping, got up the next morning, and my roommate and I decided to head back home. There was nothing more we could do. And on the way home, we're driving and, and we're talking about calling different people and telling them about Marty and telling him that he passed, calling our teammates on the football team, explaining that Marty is no longer with us. The other social media stuff was not around as much, so we were making phone calls. And we called a guy named Stan, who was a coach of ours, and he kind of took, that guy, Stan, kind of took a liking to us four, our, our roommates, me and my other three roommates. And so we knew him pretty well, so we called him to tell him, and he said, I'm on ground zero right now. And we said, wow, we, can we do anything? What can we do? And he said, come to, we were, he said, come to Jersey City, go to the dock, and 
tell them you're with Union 926. Listen, I'm Joe Stilato from Little Bethlehem. I'm not getting into ground zero, but I'm certainly going to go try to help somewhere, somehow, some way. And that's what we did. We went to Jersey City. We got to the dock. We walked in. We're with Union 926. Come on in. They put us in a tent. They put us clothes, clothes, uh, put sweatshirts on us because it was really rainy, a really ugly day out. They didn't have any raincoats, but they put me, I remember they put a, a, a garbage bag over me. Uh, they gave us a helmet and, and gave us a mask and, and off we went. We got on the, on the boat and, and, and rode over to New York City. And as we're riding over, you can just see the smoke uh, from all the fires and just, it was just an ugly, depressing day. And we pull up, uh, the boat pulls up and we get out and we're about a mile and a half away. And we didn't know where we were going. We we're just following the other union members who were there the, the day before. And we followed them and as we're walking to ground zero, you couldn't imagine uh, the emptiness in, of New York City. Nobody around, nobody. Myself, my roommate Todd, and maybe three other construction workers were walking ahead of us. And that was it. And as we walked, nobody really took notice uh, about the surrounding area, what actually happened to the surrounding area. Think about it, when those buildings came down, what occurred in the surrounding area. So as we kept walking, the buildings next to us kept getting worse and worse, and they were piling all the cars up that were smashed. They piled them up on top of each other. So as we walked, it got worse and worse. Uh, I've never been in a war zone, but it certainly looked like a war zone. And we finally turned the corner, and there was ground zero. Destruction as far as you can see. We found Stan and, and we talked to him for a little bit and then we got in line. And what that means is there was lines of people all lined up to this massive destruction. And we were passing metal pieces out by metal piece. So there we stood, handing piece by piece. And every once in a while they would yell body part and it would be in a white bucket and they would yell body part and they would hand it to me and I would yell body part to the next person. And they, I was thinking to myself, don't look down, don't look down. But I was looking for my friend Marty. So every time body part, I looked down. And I saw a lot. I saw a lot of things that hurt me later on. But as we passed it on, Every once in a while they would say, body, and then a different group of people would come in with a body bag and they would pull that out and our line would just move to the next spot. And there we go, we're just working. And I was just determined, I'm gonna find my buddy. And we went for about 10 hours that day and we just kept working, working, and trying to find our friend, not next to firemen, policemen, construction workers, and not talking. Not a word was said, not a word, just depression and just constant work. So we get out that day, uh, Stan comes over to us and says, come on guys, let's, let's get out of here. And I, I just didn't want to leave. And I said, only if we promise to come back tomorrow and he promised us. So we left, we went to Stan's house in Jersey City, we stayed overnight, we gave Marty stories, we hung out. And, then, and I stopped at a, a little store on the way in to get some breakfast, a little breakfast sandwich, and I bought a little pocket camera and I put it in my pocket. And the next day we get on the boat, we drive over, same thing, we get up to ground zero. And I took a lot of pictures that day of the, with, of the destruction and I have those pictures for fourth block when you guys, if any of you guys are there at fourth block, but I'm gonna do a little bigger presentation then. But again, we worked 15, 18 hours that day and same thing, just kept passing out pieces of steel. And before I left that day, something made me grab a piece. And I did that. But thinking I was coming back the next day, uh, you know, I, I, I was going to keep going back. I mean, it took 18 months to clean that place up, but I certainly had no uh, intentions of leaving without my friend. So I was going back every day. But the third day we tried to get in, was the day that the president was flying in and we we couldn't get in they started really checking the list and they found out that we weren't allowed in so we drove home that day 
And it's still, nothing really hit me other than the, the, the missing my friend part. And I came home and, and went through my days like, like nothing happened and, and just trying to remember my friend. And then about a week later, I was watching the news and I had my first ever anxiety attack. And if you ever had one of those, you, you know, you, you, you feel like you're dying. You feel like you're having a heart attack. And I started thinking about all the stuff I've seen and, and saw when I was passing those buckets out and, and all the, uh, the disaster from that area and just start feeling for everybody that was involved. I haven't started to talk about this. Uh, first 15 years, I didn't talk about it. Barely anybody knew I was there. I told friends and family, and that's about it. And five years ago, I started to talk about it, and it helped. It helped to talk about it to you guys. And that's why I'm here, because of you guys. Because I don't want you guys to not learn about it and educate yourself. So I challenge you, Liberty High School students, I challenge you to do something this weekend to learn about that event. Whether it's watching a documentary, whether it's watching YouTube, whether it's going home and, and, and talking to your parents about it and finding out what their thoughts were at the time, do something to learn about that event. Because if you guys don't do something, then people are going to forget. And we don't want to ever forget what happened that day. Because I know I won't. Thank you, Liberty High School. Thank you, Mr. Stolato. We certainly appreciate you sharing with us uh, your experience. And uh, uh, it certainly was an impactful uh, presentation. So we thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank um, everyone else that was here today. Um, I want to definitely thank our music programs. Uh, who contributed uh, and did such an amazing job. Um, I want to thank our police officers and firemen uh, who joined us today. Uh, so many of them have friends who uh, were in 9-11. Uh, and thank all of our teachers and staff for uh, coming here. And I believe Dr. Roy is here somewhere. Um, I thank him as well. Oh, there he goes. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Um, just briefly, I want to say, uh, what you heard from Mr. Stellato was a personal experience. And that personal experience pushed him and those individuals that he was close to to search for their friend. What I remember um, was on that day, sitting at my desk, I was at Parkland at that time, and I was watching this happen on television, literally watching the second plane hit. And it's, it is, as Mr. Stilato said, an experience that you never forget. But the thing to remember is no matter how bad something is, something beautiful comes out of it. And what you saw in the weeks after that event was a nation come together in a way that we had not seen since Pearl Harbor. You saw people from every walk of life come together. People were fighting to get into New York City to help. You had people donating everything they had right, to, to, to survivors of this, to those who were in, the, in trying to help. Not just in New York, but in Pennsylvania, where the plane landed, and DC. You saw a nation come together. I can tell you in my time here at Liberty, that is something I see here. We are a school that when someone is in need, we come together. I don't want you to forget the power of that. The power of doing something positive together. 
you are so powerful and you can impact this country, this world, if you do it together. In every bad experience, no matter how bad it is, something beautiful comes out of it. We have to always remember that, find that little stripe of beauty, and come together around it. I thank all of you for your attention, for being here. I hope that many of you join Mr. Stellato this afternoon for his presentation. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and you spend time this weekend, just some portion of time, remembering what happened on 9-11.